You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the books Long Walk Up, Portia, Love More Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. Good morning, good morning, good morning out there in off-the-shelf world. Whether you're tuning in via iTunes, Google Play, so many ways, YouTube, you're tuning in via Ball Talk Radio, we want to welcome you, welcome you, welcome you this Saturday morning. It has been raining so much where I live here in the southeast of the United States. I mean, it just cloudy and rainy like every day. But it looks like the sun is peeking out, so I'm welcoming the sun. For those of you who have been here with us, our loyal listeners, you've been here 17 years with us. We just want to thank you, thank you, thank you. And for you, those you just... Like, what am I going to do this Saturday morning? And you turn in the dial. You, we used to actually be on the radio. You're on the Internet looking around, what am I going to do? And you stop by. We want to wish you a gracious welcome and let you know that you are listening to the Winning Book Podcast show, Off the Shelf. Welcome again to this Saturday, December the 10th show. And I can't thank you enough, and I sincerely mean it, for joining us. When I started this show, no way. Did I think I'd be doing this for 17 years? We have a wonderful, wonderful guest on deck for you this morning. Excited to introduce you to our guest to you and connect you and start exploring our guest work and their and their writings. So, off the shelf listeners, before we do that, I want to just say it, I, I like to watch mysteries. I like to watch mystery sto- shows. I think I like to try to figure things out before it's revealed or figure out somebody's motives before it's revealed. You know, real life offers deeper, really when you think about it, real life offers deeper, more complex mysteries than even books and and, and great movies. But that's not to say that books can't tell real life mysteries in a powerful way. And in fact, Escaping to a Freedom is such a mystery and a suspense book that pulls that off. So Clarissa, to give you guys a little backstory, Clarissa, she's a writer and she's vacationing in the North Georgia mountains. It's very calm, quaint. There are some areas you can't even get Wi-Fi or Internet access. She's trying to stir her creative juices to gain enough just to get herself going so she can write this next novel, which she hopes will turn out to be a New York Times and an Essence bestseller like her last novel was. But the things go as we plan. <laughs> she isn't in the mountains two full days when she spots what looks like a girl hiding by her cabin. So she invites the girl inside the cabin that she's renting up in the mountains, and that single solitary move changes her life forever. If you want to know what happens to Carissa, and Escaping Toward Freedom. I encourage you to get a copy of Escaping Toward Freedom. You can get it in ebook or paperback. And it's also in hardback. And find out what happened to Carissa and these girls. It's a fast paced suspense mystery read. And now, let us go and meet our very special off the shelf guest. And today's guest is Maggie. I hope I say the name correctly, and if not, I hope they correct me, Maggie Boyer. And Maggie is a poet who hails from Greensboro, North Carolina, and they have performed around the country for years. Their first poetry collection is titled The Whole Story. Other works they have written include When I Bleed, poems about endometriosis, ungodly, and allergies. In addition to writing poetry, Maggie enjoys gardening, Caring for three cats and cooking. Please check Maggie Boyer out online at, and I'll spell it, it's MaggieBoyer.com, M-A-G-G-I-E-B-O-W-Y-E-R.com, M-A-G-G-I-E-B-O-W-Y-E-R.com. We are absolutely honored to have Maggie join us here on Off the Shelf this morning. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Maggie. 
I am honored to be here, Denise. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you're doing well this morning. Yes, yes, yes. Like I say, a little bit of sun's coming out where I, where I live I, now. I think. Is it raining where you are? Rainy? It has been all week. A little sun is popping out now for us, too. Thank goodness. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it, where I live, it, I think when I, was, when I was stationed in Hawaii in the Navy, they didn't hit you because you don't have snow over there. Their winter was rain, 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 rain. And I think for like two months it just rained every day. But um, I appreciate all the days. I appreciate all the experiences. So I'm not complaining, but it's good to see the sun. Now, Maggie, the way the show goes, the first three to four questions, I ask every single guest who comes on the show the same question. Again, I tell people when I started the show, I just launched right into talking about their books. And I got emails from listeners that said, please don't do that. Let us know a little bit about the guests before you start talking about the books. So to launch today's show, Maggie, can you tell off-the-shelf listeners where you grew up and what life was like for you growing up? Absolutely. I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina, born, raised, and still here. Um, I grew up with uh, my mom and my dad and my oldest sibling, and now I have a five- and seven-year-old brother and an incredible stepmom. So I have a huge family, and I adore my family. I adore taking care of them and spending time with them. That's the main reason I'm still in the same city I grew up is to be with my family. So family is is big to me and I have my little family uh, like you said. So take care of my three cats and and that's writing poetry, spending time with my family and cats. That's my life. So I want to ask you two questions. Number one, I don't think I've ever been to Greensboro. I've tra- traveled a lot. What is it like a small town of maybe a two, three thousand people? Can you, if, if pardon my ignorance, what is what is it like? Are you like in the, in the is it in the country on the, on a farm, a lot of farmland? Oh, you're fine. No, actually, so North Carolina, the biggest cities are Raleigh and Charlotte, but Greensboro is the third or fourth largest city in North Carolina. Uh, so I am kind of in the heart of everything. We have seven colleges, I think. So I live right in between my alma mater and another college. I live literally right in between them. Um, it's a big liberal city. Uh, we have so many fun festivals and fun things going on all the time. So I absolutely love it. We are right next to High Point, which is where the furniture market is. Otherwise, High Point's pretty dead. Um, and then surrounding, we do have a lot of, like, country surrounding, but we're kind of like the city of the little country area. Oh, my goodness. See, I learned something. Now, my neighbor has a cat. I, For some reason, cats – I. <laughs> They're very mysterious to the point where they, I'm a little uncertain around them. Is there a way to tell if a cat is okay with you if you don't interact oh with it a lot? Yeah, so I think that cats are a fantastic lesson in consent is what I always tell people. I, I say you just let them come to you. You know, if, if the cat – I have one cat that literally has met almost no one because she's so afraid. She just hides the entire time anyone comes over. But another one, she loves people. And so she just comes up and she's like, hey, what's up? And she's meowing and rubbing against you. So I feel like cats really show you what they want and um, what they're comfortable with. And if you just kind of listen and take cues from them, they they really come to you and, and are super sweet and loving if, if you let them come to you. Ah, okay, okay. So if they, if okay, I always think they're mysterious, and I'm like, I don't know if they're gonna lunge at me or. <laughs> I mean, my, my brother has a new rescue cat, and I don't feel comfortable around them either. You, I just don't know what they're thinking. A dog, I feel more There's like no, I know what it's thinking. Cats are very dogs mysterious. Dogs are not happy. Dogs are so outwardly happy, I think, and feel like I want to please you, and cats are like. Oh no, you gotta please me. <laughs> <laughs> Some people love them. My cousin, my my cousin has one, Queenie. Queenie, she runs the show, but her own mother is wasn't comfortable with Queenie. She wasn't comfortable with the cat. So uh, all all the cats and all animals are beautiful. They just so mysterious to me. They are. And now, as a as a kid, 
It's another question I ask every guest. As a kid, Maggie, what did you want to be? What did you dream of being as a kid when you grew up? What did you want to be? I always wanted to be a writer. I also wanted to be an English teacher. I kind of pivoted. I went and started college as an English education major. Um, I've always wanted to write, but uh, education was something that was really important to me. I realized I couldn't do what I wanted to for students in my current state and education system. And so I, I figured, you know, going and doing independent writing, I could teach workshops and do a lot more of what I wanted to do for students versus the education system. And I I totally respect and honor teachers. Like, it is incredible if you are able to make that system work and and be there for students. I just personally couldn't do it. And so I pivoted, and I was a business major. I graduated business administration from UNCG. And now I I teach workshops and I write. And so I'm still kind of, you know, following in, in the theme of what I always wanted to do. Oh, good for you. You are a rare guest on Off the Shelf. We focus on stories. We've had movie producers, script writers, actresses. We've had uh, poets, novelists, nonfiction writers, all types of people with things focused on story, particularly books on Off the Shelf. Very rarely do we have a guest who wanted to, who's a writer, but that was their childhood dream. They all want to be something else. As a kid, you, you're very rare. It's, it's very rare that somebody says, I wanted to be a writer, and then they, they actually went on to become a writer. Now, what is it, I think Maggie, it's, about – go ahead. No, go ahead. You I was going to say, I think it's really – I think if we're really lucky if we can come back to what we wanted to do when we were children, you know, if, if we're able to rediscover what we wanted to do and achieve some form of that dream, I think it's it's really lucky. So I'm, I'm very lucky. You know, I agree. Now, what is it about poetry that speaks so deeply to you? Oh, my goodness. So when I was 14 or 15, I, I was really, really into fiction writing and novels. And, and I was writing multiple full-length novels. And I went to a workshop in New York, and I absolutely loved it. And I fell in love with poetry. I I was trying to write some some new stories, and, and it wasn't coming out. And, and my professors really pushed me to kind of do something different. And so I started writing poetry in that time and I fell in love with it. And I came home and I started a poetry club at my school. I started competing in spoken word and started going all over the country doing spoken word because I I truly just fell head over heels. I don't know. It was a way to tell a story in a succinct way, a way to place someone in a memory and, and give that to them. I feel like a lot of people even though poetry seems inaccessible to a lot of people, so is novels in some ways. You know, not a lot of us have time or energy to sit down and read a novel, whereas a poem could be a very short, quick thing if you're open to listening, you know. And so yeah, I, I think recently, it has the ability. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, absolutely. I, I came across a book of poetry. I was in, uh, a, I'm trying to find it now, the author. I, I actually emailed her because I enjoyed her poetry. It was so powerful so much. Uh with an a- April Green and I told her, I said, Oh my gosh, it just really spoke to me. Like your poetry you find mm-hmm. it finds its readers and you the impact your poetry has on people, you can't even imagine the powerful impact. It can literally change somebody's day or their life. Just mm-hmm. you think, Oh wow your, your poetry, good poetry to me, it comes from the writer's soul as well. So I think it's really, really impactful. Now, you said you did spoken word and you've traveled. You're like a, somebody who just gets out there, which I really admire that about you. Now, do you, when you perform poetry live on stage, could you share what that experience is like? Spoken word used to be really big for a while. What's it like to doing that in, in front of an audience? Oh, gosh, it used to be so intimidating, honestly. I had such stage fright. I would turn red from head to toe, honestly. I would be, like, bright red on stage. But 
at some point I started to place myself in the moment that I wrote that poem or the moment that I wrote the poem about and rather than being on stage. And it became very therapeutic. It became this moment of I wasn't on stage. I wasn't experiencing the stage fright. I was truly healing from these memories and, and putting myself in this vulnerable place in front of other people and completely zoned out of the audience. I They weren't even there or they aren't even there. And I just drop into the moment that inspired that poem. And it's, it's really healing to then hear, come back to yourself and hear people snapping and, and being excited and really the energy that comes from spoken word, I think is what's the true draw, just the being able to actually experience other people hearing your words and connecting with them and having that moment and being able to feel that energy, the stomping on the ground, the, the clapping, the, the whooping, you know, all of those things, it really creates this energy that makes all of that going into that moment worth it and healing. Like if you're going through, like if you're sharing something that's traumatic or I know that, the year I went to Brave New Voices, there was a lot of um, police brutality in the news, and a lot of people felt very seen by the spoken word and in healing. A lot of people did tributes and were able to kind of just heal a little part of their experience. It doesn't heal the, the world we live in, of course, but it does heal maybe their experience just a little to be able to be on stage and know other people understand what they're going through. And I, I experienced that as well, you know, hearing other people come up and say, you know, like, I've had a similar experience to you with this, and it just really heals you. And so I think that's what's the real draw of spoken word. So for our listeners, and I always like to share tips as well, um, so Maggie, can, what if somebody mm-hmm. was interested in doing spoken word? How would they learn about any spoken word events they could participate in? How do you how do you learn about events near you or if they have to travel to them? How do you find out about those events? Yeah, I think that, like, Facebook is a great resource because they always post, you know, like, events in your area and things like that. And I always look for open mics. Um, I think that's a great way to get involved with your community. A lot of times coffee shops, independent bookstores, things like that will host open mics from different teams in your area. And so those are much more chill, you know, environments, very laid back where people are workshopping new pieces, reading straight from their phone, you know, just having a very chill moment. And, and I think that is the place where you can start connecting and meeting poets in your area and saying like, oh, hey, like, you know, what are you guys, do you guys have a practice? Do you have a team? Do you have slams? Do you have these kind of things? And so I think open mics are a great way to, and so like, yeah, look at your local coffee shops and bookstores. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. Now, will you tell us about Ungodly? We want to start talking about your books and definitely want to get to When I Bleed, but can you tell us about Ungodly? Yeah, Ungodly is my most recent release. Um, It came out at the beginning of this year. It is about being a queer disabled survivor and, and moving through our world with those kind of marginalized identities, but that create community. I think that there's something really powerful. You know, the disability community is huge and the survivor community is huge and the queer community is huge. And it's much bigger than I think that any of us realize. We walk through day to day and and we don't think about those things, but they're, they're huge communities. And I wanted this book to kind of represent those experiences that often overlap and that we see often intersect together those identities and share my experience. And it was really nice that some people who were in one or two of those identities, you know, some of my disabled friends were able to understand more of my queer identity by reading this book and things like that. And so it was really powerful, I think, to be able to share and help different communities that I'm involved, like I'm a part of kind of connect with each other. Okay. And, 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 so it's a book really, again, like poetry, like I was talking about the, the book of poetry I discovered about a week ago. It is very healing. It's empowering. It's healing. And I, I, that's one thing I do like about about poetry. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit as we start to talk about When I Believe. How similar or different 
is endometriosis. I have a relative who has fibromyalgia, and she said it's you're in, and I have another relative who has sickle cell. You're like in pain, like nonstop almost with the, mm-hmm. with the fibromyalgia. Um, it, how different or similar is endometriosis? If you if you are familiar with fibromyalgia, I'm trying yeah. to. So I actually also have fibromyalgia, and so I have both. So both fibromyalgia and endometriosis are on the NHS's list of the top 20 most painful conditions known to mankind, including heart attacks, broken bones, and labor, uh, unmedicated labor. So fibromyalgia causes daily pain. Endometriosis, some people experience pain only on their cycles or at ovulation, and then other people experience pain every single day. I experience pain every day. I recently had endometriosis excision surgery, which is the gold standard of care for endometriosis. Um, and it's where they go in and they remove every area of endometriosis and cut it out. And that has given me a lot of my life back. Uh, I still deal with daily pain, but it's not nearly as debilitating as it was. Um, my fibromyalgia is still pretty debilitating. But, um, yeah, I think that a lot of chronic pain conditions are a lot more debilitating than people realize. I think that um, it, it takes a lot to be in pain every day at any level. You know, you wake up and you're sore for a few days and you're like, oh, gosh, I wish this would, like, stop. But it when you're chronically ill it never stops you know it's going to be the rest of your life when you wake up you're going to have those deep aches and those pains uh endometriosis in particular is stabbing burning shooting uh, barbed wire those are often uh, a lot of the different adjectives people describe the endometriosis pain as it's a lot of pelvic pain but it can also cause pain in every area of the body um endometriosis has been found in every organ of the body, actually. So in the brain, in the lungs, everywhere. So a lot of people think it's just a reproductive disease, but it is not. It is a full body disease. And it's re- and so only women would, would have this. And when did they, like, when did science, medical science, even start to learn what this is? Yeah, so they think that a lot of people that we had, like, you know, in the Salem witch trials and things like that, a lot of those people they think had endometriosis um, because of the the reactions that they had and the screaming and the fits of pain and things like that. So we started to see the, the symptoms of endometriosis in our history a lot earlier, but in the 1940s, the first laparoscopic surgery was performed and endometriosis was found, and they... Originally, the theory was that it was retrograde menstruation where your period just spreads to other parts of the body. That has been disproven, um, and it's actually when you're a fetus, when you're being born and created. It, wow. Um, is, yeah, so actually they have studied stillborn babies and have found that 9% of fetuses, both male and female, have endometriosis. So right now it's treated as a women's disease, but um, we have found that actually there are cases of cis men. It's it's rare that it's diagnosed in cis men right now, but um, I think that that will become more and more common as we do more research on endometriosis and different genders. Do they they don't know, do they know what causes it? Anything that can even um, be. Yeah, so the main theory right now, the top experts, are that when our reproductive tract is being created, as we're being created and formed as fetuses, um, it just goes to the wrong places. It gets confused, and it it deposits in your lungs or in your bowels and different areas that it's not supposed to be. And so then it, it forms incorrectly in your body. So, Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I like fibromyalgia. I think that was one that was just discovered not too long ago. You know, sometimes I think ago. about yeah, not too long ago. I think about uh, like people with ADHD and 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 autism. When I was in school, there I never heard ADD or ADHD. How many people? Uh, and then there's the other one. I, I have a friend whose daughter has it. I can't think of it right now. But there's another one with dyslexia. So 
dyslexia is about more than seeing words backwards. It might not even be that. It's just you can read a book or something that, with dyslexia, and you can't concept the whole meaning of it, so you don't really understand it, and it's, it's difficult. And so uh, mm-hmm. there are different conditions like this. Years ago, I think about the stuff we said years ago, just like we know more about the weather. Before it was Zeus or somebody causing a storm or some other guy causing the rain. But we know more now. So even with medical science, I, my heart goes out to people who years ago might have had ADD or, or dyslexia or, or something, and nobody knew, and they just thought, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and you don't know oh, the yeah. person. I, my heart goes out. I mean, to those people, like, you think 100 years ago, what was their life like? Oh, my God. So it's, it's, yeah. helpful, it's helpful that as we keep learning and studying, it makes it better for all of us. Now, can and you think tell us faster? Mm-hmm. You said you think we what we'll do what? I think things will go faster as we do more research. We're just getting smarter, and which is a good thing. Can you tell us about some of the poems in your book? When I bleed, poems about endometriosis. What are some of the things that you focus on in the book? Yeah, so I focus a lot on chronic pain, on um, gaslighting from medical professionals, and um, trauma with that, um, and infertility. So those are kind of the three main topics in the book. Um, Actually, both my mother and my stepmother have endometriosis as well, and um, I have two siblings who are rainbow babies after loss um, because of endometriosis, and so uh, my family family has definitely dealt with loss and infertility due to endometriosis and not just myself, you know, with my siblings. And so a lot of the book is about those kind of losses and, and the way it impacts families and loved ones and, and a lot about the pain too. I really wanted to give endometriosis warriors something where they could hand this to a relative and say, like, this is what I'm going for. You know, this is this is what I'm going through. But I also wanted there to be poems that show, you know, you're going to get through this and there will be better days, you know, some, some hopeful poems. Um, so there's there's one that's called Reminders, and it's if there was once good days, then logically there will be good days again. Um, because I think we all need that reminder, you know, that, like, there will always be a better day. There will always be a worse day, but there will always be a better day, too. And uh, so I think that there's there's a few hopeful reminders throughout the book. And at the end, I do have a endometriosis fact sheet. Um, so it kind of goes over all the basic endometriosis research and facts and the, treat, the main treatments and symptom management, um, different things that you can do for your endometriosis and a few different resources. So I try and uh, make sure that everybody has that. So the ebook for When I Bleed is 99 cents and it will always be 99 cents so that as many people as possible can have those resources. Well, if, if you have time sometime today, let me know if you'd like to read a poem from from the book. I, I would love to share it with um, with our listeners. Now, that, that said, do you find, are you in a, in a, in, in a community where you, uh, you, with people who have this endo, endometriosis, do they tell you, because it's not a word I hear a lot. Like my cousin with fibromegalia, I don't hear a lot. I had a lady we interviewed on Off the Shelf. She had had a brain tumor, and she didn't even know she had it, but her mm-hmm. son said she was acting strange. So he encouraged her to go to the doctor, and she found she had a brain tumor. She said that surgery was coming, recovering from it was difficult. She said, but she got fibromegalia afterwards. She said that was worse than dealing with the mm-hmm. surgery from the brain tumor. She told me so. When you when you're do, are you in community where you're in connection with people who have endometriosis? Do they tell you that it's a disease they that, that they try to keep hidden? Nobody would understand it. What do what do people tell you how they personally deal with it? 
Yeah, I think there used to be a lot of stigma around this illness because it, it deals with so many taboo things. It deals with, you know, periods, painful sex, infertility, a lot of things that we don't like to talk about as society. And, and it's a disease that impacts marginalized people. It impacts mainly women. Um, and we're finding that it's often been touted as a white woman's disease, but it is equal in all races and so we're seeing an increase in diagnosis in black and women of color because now we're finally doing research so i think that it's important that we keep talking about it i think that there's been a burst in the last few years of people talking about endometriosis hillary clinton just did a um, she executive produced a film called indo what and uh the second film for them and so we're seeing a lot more high profile names talking about it halsey for example has endometriosis and has been talking about it more um amy schumer different celebrities um, um, are trying to talk about it more. And I think that's really important because it is, like you're saying, something we haven't talked about. But I wouldn't, it takes on average 10 years to get a diagnosis in the U.S. I wow. went 13 years without a diagnosis. Yeah, I went 13 years without a diagnosis and I still got diagnosed considered early in age. I was 21. And um, the only reason I, yeah, my mother and my stepmother had endometriosis and I had never heard of it. Uh, my neither of my parents ever talked about it, and so it was it was very taboo when they were growing up and when they were dealing with it the most. And so nobody had ever talked to me about it. And I was scrolling through Instagram one day uh, during Endometriosis Awareness Month, and one of my friends posted about endometriosis and about some of the symptoms. And I messaged her. We weren't even friends at the time. We're, we're good friends now. And I messaged her, and I was like, Hey, like this sounds really familiar to me. Like this sounds like what I'm going through. Can I ask you a few more questions we started talking about it and I was convinced and within six months I fought with I, I fought with I think three four doctors um, before I got surgery um, and they finally uh, a doctor performed surgery for me and I got diagnosed within six months but it could have been years and years later before I ever heard of endometriosis if somebody hadn't posted on Instagram so I think we're seeing social media be a really huge part in in fact there's like articles um by the new york times and self magazine about the internet kind of being this community that is doing and raising awareness for endometriosis in particular but really all chronic illnesses um i think that there's a really big community online of chronic illness uh warriors oh my god 13 years Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's making me think about this commercial. This black woman is driving, and she has some type of thing that comes up. She said she couldn't drive. She couldn't hardly. It's, and she said all seven years she took to get a right diagnosis on what was wrong with her. Mm -hmm. And it was it's a very a painful condition. But that is amazing. Because when you, when you think of a doctor for some reason, at least I do, you think they would know. Like they would know to mm -hmm. do a test. And they know, but uh, gluten is another one. We had a guest on, and a, a, she was a, a talent agent in Hollywood. She said that she was going to doctor, doctor, spending so much money, and then finally she started researching herself, and she found out she could not have gluten. And and she said she found that out on her own. So you have to take responsibility mm -hmm. too for your for your own life. I'm curious though, before we go into talking more about about your book and your other books, how many people would you say have endometriosis? Right now, the estimate is 20 million people around the world. So oh. it is as common as diabetes or asthma. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so we don't talk about it nearly enough. Uh, like I said, if we talked about it as much as diabetes or asthma, I think that things would really improve. And I think we're getting there. You know, I think that we're starting to hear a lot more about this in more recent years. But it's it's definitely something that's a lot more common than we think it is. And so when does it – so for our listeners who might have it and don't know – when is, or they might know somebody, when generally does, do the symptoms show up? And so are there symptom signs associated with it? And when do they generally show up? 
Yeah, so mine started with my first period, but some people don't. Um, about one-third of people with endometriosis, it starts with their first period is when the pain starts. Um, I was immediately hospitalized in middle of school with my period, and we didn't know what was going on. The pain was so bad, um, and, and no one was figuring out what was going on. GI dysfunction is another main early warning sign for teens. Um, before pain starts, a lot of teens go through GI problems that they never figure out and get diagnosed with IBS. Um, so that's another main warning sign if you're having pain and you're going to the GI doctor and they're not finding anything. Uh, endometriosis is a major red flag there. Um, and then a lot of people also start to have worsening symptoms after pregnancy. So um, by the time you're in your mid-20s, a lot of times the pain is very debilitating. So even if it didn't start um, early in your life, uh, by your mid-20s, you usually have some symptoms. Uh, but about... Oh. One in five people have no symptoms, and it's just infertility. So if you're uh, experiencing unexplained infertility, if you're experiencing uh, difficulty getting pregnant or unexplained miscarriages and losses, that is another um, main sign of endometriosis, even if you have no pain. Oh, my gosh. I'm mm -hmm. listening to you, and I'm thinking about people. I've known, and I'm like, I wonder if they had it. And then also mm -hmm. the money you could spend on fertility it was drugs and, and care is so expensive, and you would have that and wouldn't even know it. Oh, my goodness, thank mm -hmm. you for what you shared. Let me know if you are willing and free, uh, to ready to, to read a poem. I wanted to ask you one more question. Definitely, are there steps that people can take to ease the pain? Is there anything they could eat, a tea, something to drink, and a, a, anything to help ease the pain? Yeah, so lots of people find different things. I, I don't like to um, diss any of the different um, symptom management methods because everybody has access to different things. So there's different herbal teas. I, I drink herbal tea um, from a local herbalist that's just like the womb tea blend um, and the PMS blends and things like that. Um, so, so that's definitely finding out what foods trigger you. I know gluten is a big one, um, sugar, uh, dairy, but it's all hit or miss. You know, everybody's body is different. So gluten might bother me and my endometriosis, and it might not bother yours. So definitely a trial and error thing, um, but more anti-inflammatory Mediterranean diet, uh, different things like that, uh, anti-inflammatory. Um, I know that a lot of 7 and 10 Indo warriors use different types of cannabis products to um, uh, manage their pain, even if you're not comfortable with, like, smoking and things like that. There's CBD suppositories. Those are um, to help the pelvic floor relax. Um, and then people have success with birth control. Um, about 17% of people go into, like, a remission of symptoms with birth control. Um, GnRH antagonist drugs are the next level up from birth control. It's things like Lupron and Orlissa. They have serious side effects and do uh, cost a lot of money. So I typically recommend, if you're going to spend the money on that, to go the route of excision surgery. Um, not everyone has access, though. So, you know, if, if you have access to the medications, um, you know, do what's best for you. Um, but excision surgery is the gold standard. So there's multiple kinds of surgery. The only way to officially diagnose endo is through surgery, unfortunately. And so there's ablation, which burns the lesions but leaves them there, and they can come back a lot faster. And then there's excision, which cuts them out and removes them, uh, and that leads to longer-lasting relief. So that is the number one treatment for endometriosis, but unfortunately, it's really hard to access, which is why I say, you know, if you have access to birth control or medication or tea, different things like that, do what you can, you know? Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Who knows who will listen to this show and finally think, oh, thank you. Thank goodness. I oh, I know one person, even just yeah. one person. That's the goal, you know? Yeah, yeah. What have readers been saying about When I Bleed, poems, poems about endometriosis? What feedback have you been getting from readers? I am so honored by the feedback from When I Bleed. It is my most popular collection, and I'm I'm completely honored and floored. I have people send me they have printed out and 
framed poems to put next to their surgery pictures and things like that um, because they say that the poems are really validating. And I think whether you're diagnosed or not, um, if you have, like, chronic pain, especially pelvic pain, this book, I hope, will, will resonate with you in a way that just makes you feel seen and heard and makes you feel like, you know, whether or not you have a diagnosis, that those symptoms are valid and that a lot of us go through years and years of that medical gaslighting and not knowing what's going on. So that's not, like, you're not alone just because you don't have a diagnosis. And so that's that's the main thing I want people to take away is that they're not alone. Um, there's 20 million of us going through this, you know what I mean? And there's you know, I think it's 25% of the world population is dealing with some form of disability. And so, you know, it, it's a huge community and you're not alone. And that's that's the main thing I want to take away from when I bleed. And I think that's the main thing people have taken away. And, and that's a really big honor that I was able to kind of achieve that goal. You know what I mean? Yes. Can you read a poem from it or do you not? Let me know if you're Absolutely. ready or not. Absolutely. I am, yeah. This one's called endobelly. So a main symptom of endometriosis is bloating, like really painful bloating that makes you look three to six months pregnant. Um, and so it, it's really painful. So this poem's called endobelly. I learned how to hate my body long before I desired to love my body. A preteen with a bulging abdomen surrounded by judgment, I learned to never give myself the breath my lungs desperately craved lest my core expand beyond my control. There is a constant reframing process happening in my mind, even as I scan my body for any looming threats. We are at war. I have to remind myself we are on the same side. Wow. Wow, yeah. That's kind of, yeah, about that. You're you're not Yeah, that is powerful. You know what? That could be for any... You can do that for people with body image, anything. Mm-hmm. Where there, it's a lot of different reasons somebody can really relate to that point. That's a powerful yeah. point. That's Thank powerful. You. Thank you. Thank you for reading that and sharing that. And there again, that's something that and 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 in the book when I believe poems about endometriosis, a lot of people who don't have a chronic illness, from reading that poem you read, might be able to get a lot from the book even if they don't have a chronic illness, because some of it could do with, like, your self-image, how you perceive and accept and yeah. love yourself. Uh, that's just something that, even if you don't have a chronic illness, you could benefit and maybe feel more empowered and more willing to love yourself mm-hmm. uh, after reading the book. Now we're going to move on to a different one, and definitely I encourage people to get When I Bleed poems about endometriosis. That poem you just read is is goes beyond uh, endometriosis. Uh, can you give us an overview of the whole story? The whole story. Yes. That was my first collection. That was my debut collection, and it holds a little special place in my heart. I think I've, I've done a lot work I'm a lot more proud of, which is the goal, you know, to always improve. But it still holds a very special place in my heart. I was just coming out of a really uh, toxic relationship, a really abusive relationship. And I kind of, I felt like I needed no one. I feel like a lot of us when we come through that or losing a friendship or, you know, any kind of situation where there's like a loss involved, sometimes you don't get to tell your side of the story, you know what I mean? And people believe a different side of the story or they don't even ask your your side of the story. And this was kind of my opportunity to be like, you know what, no matter who's listening, I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to I'm going to say what happened to me. I'm going I'm going to feel empowered. I'm going to heal from this and write about it and and see kind of just share what happened to me and I found that I connected with a lot of survivors through that. Um, A lot of people that just shared the similar experience, you know, I didn't, it didn't have, you know, the, the original petty almost goal of like, oh, telling my story to the people who I, I knew at the time. But instead it connected me with this vast group of survivors and with people who even at my college and things like that would reach out to me and be like, hey, like, I really related to this. And and I was able to stand up for myself in this situation because of this book. And that was really powerful and an honor because even though 
I wasn't telling my story to the people who were around at the time. I was telling my story to people who really related to it and who needed to hear it the most. You have a lot of courage, Maggie. And you know what? No. <laughs> It, it see you you come across even if you don't if, even if you're not fully aware of it, and so um, it's that courage I think of so many writers uh, and people in general whether they they they're speaking it they they're writing about it they they're telling their story because it takes courage to tell us your story and even even if it's just a novel because you're going to get feedback so even if you just publish oh, a novel can. people are going to let you know what they think. They're gonna. They, it, it takes courage to get that feedback. It Creating really does. art is one of the most terrifying and brave things I think someone can do, including podcasting. Because like you're you're out here and you're bearing your soul and you're talking to people and you're putting your voice out there. So I, I just think anything creative like that is such a brave thing to do. Yeah, and I agree. And also though, with the, your type of what the topics you take on. And they're personal to you. You, it's through you that other people can be empowered. You may never know who they are. You may never, never know who they are. But as you have that courage to share your story, you can help somebody just get a little bit more empowered, just a little bit more as they go through their life. I'm telling you, I thank you for that. And people who do have that courage to share, it can, it can help so many other people who may never tell you, you may never know who they are, but just a little shred of more empowerment as you share your story, other people can gain. Now, I wanted to ask you, we're going back to the whole story, how did you pull yourself out of the trauma you were facing? How did you pull yourself out? Like, come on, come on, Maggie, let's go. How did you pull yourself out of it? I think that it was a combination of an incredible support system. I think that I had spent years, you know, cultivating an incredible support system that were there for me. And a lot of people after they get out of abusive relationships don't have that because they are isolated and things. I was lucky enough that my support system was immediately like, yep, we're back. We're here, you know, um, so a combination of that support system and and art, you know, I was at first I started writing to just bare my soul and to get it out of my head and to get it on the paper and maybe get some of these memories from tormenting me and, and just get them out, you know. And, and as I started to do that, I started to really, it was really cathartic. And I started to really actually get rid of some of it and get it off my chest. And so I started to be able to write poems about happier things or at least about neutral things or about hope for the future, even if I wasn't happy then. And so I really started to see that, like, life could move on. And, and it was through writing that I found that, that I was like, oh, you know, I might not be happy now, but I might be again one day. Mm. Now, at your website, you say healing can be tumultuous. I would this I found it very curious. Why is healing tumultuous? I think it can bring up the past, you know what I mean? Like I I was healing from this toxic relationship and it brought up a lot of childhood memories, you know, a lot of childhood trauma and things I had gone through and I had to heal from things from 10, 15, 20 years ago as I'm healing from something that happened two weeks ago, you know what I mean? And so I think that healing was tumultuous because I would I would think I would start to get better and I'd get hit with this wave of, like, the past and this wave of these old memories that were buried for so long. And so I think healing was is, is and was very tumultuous, but it gets better. It gets a lot easier. You get – it's almost like swimming and you're going through all these big waves, but eventually you start to get the hang of it. You're like, okay, if I hold my breath when I go under, when, the, when these waves come, I'll be okay. Or if I go down to the bottom of the pool and push myself back up, I'll, I'll come out fine. You know, you, you get that. And I think writing allowed me to have that, um, you know, I'm going to get out of this just fine. Okay. We are coming down to probably about the, down the last 10, 12 minutes of today's show, and I have so many more questions I want to ask you. <laughs> For our listeners, we are speaking with Maggie Bauer, Maggie Bauer, and she has written several books. She held some 
from Greensboro, North Carolina, the whole story, which we touched on very, very briefly. When I bleed, poems about endometriosis, ungodly, and allergies. And I encourage you to check her out online at maggiebauer.com, M-A-G-G-I-E-B-O-W-Y-E-R.com. Again, that's M-A-G-G-I-E-B-O-W-Y-E-R.com. You can go over there now, even as you uh, listen to her what she's sharing with us here on Off the Shelf uh, this morning. And we just got through talking about how healing can be tumultuous. You can think you're doing fine and then something else surfaces until you move all the way through something. And then we know in this world there will probably be something else coming up next, even after a little <laughs> um, Now, you talk also about the importance of acceptances, which is a part to me the healing work you're doing, just sharing your own personal story, where you probably don't maybe not see it as empowering to others or healing, but it's almost like you're giving other people the permission to uh, to 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 be empowered and not embarrassed or ashamed about something they're going through when you tell your story. Now, so you talk about the importance of acceptances. Are there, Maggie? For somebody listening to Off the Shelf today, are there indications that they might not be accepting themselves? They might think they are, but they might not be. Yeah, that bitterness. You know, I, and I, we all get, we all have these moments. So I'm not perfect at acceptance or anything. But if you, if you have some bitterness, or you're not, you're you're angry that you're you have some sort of personality trait, or you're bitter that the past is the way it is, um, and and then you're not really accepting. Even if you're like, okay, that happened, I, I accept that that happened, but you're or I accept this is the way I am, but you linger this bitterness. You probably haven't fully accepted it, like, in your body all the way. And so I think it's it's about meditating on that and, and really releasing the need to change things. You know, we are, we're all given our gifts and we're all given our personality traits to make the best of them. And so the first step in making the best of those gifts is accepting them for what they are. Mm, and that comes through work again. Like, so you never give up on yourself. You just have to just keep saying, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to awaken. I'm going mm-hmm. to, you just have to and then do that work now. Have you ever thought about, and this just popped into my head, I don't know why. Can, can, you, can you offer any tips to somebody, Maggie, again, we're under 10 minutes, but who is feeling like giving up? I don't know why that just popped into my head, but somebody who might feel like mm-hmm. I just I can't do anymore, even if they've been trying to accept themselves and heal. Any any real quick words you could share with that person if they're they're really deep in that right now? Yeah, it really does get better and easier, and it changes. You know, grief or self loathing. It it doesn't get easier, but you can it changes and you get stronger. And if you continue to put that work in to keep accepting yourself and to create a life worth living, that's the thing. I still suffer depression and I still suffer from PTSD and panic attacks, but I've built a life worth living outside of those things. And I think that is the most important thing is is realizing that no matter how you feel some days, you are worth a life worth living. And so to create, to find the things that make you you and to find the things that make you happy, whether that's cats or dogs or fish or friends or music or poetry or writing novels or reading novels, you know, whatever those things that make life worth living that you can wake up and say, you know, I'm excited for today because I can listen to my favorite song. I'm excited for today because I'm going to see my best friends. I'm excited for today. Even if, you know, you have some dread for, I have to go to work today. I'm dreading this. I'm dreading, you know, having to cook dinner or do the dishes. But I'm really excited to taste that food that I'm nourishing myself with. I'm really excited to, you know, have some friends over for dinner and and connect and laugh with them and creating that life worth living. And, And sometimes you won't feel like you're deserving of that, but your friends are deserving of that, right? So why wouldn't you be? Your loved ones are deserving of that. So why wouldn't you be? So forcing yourself to create that life worth living really over time, 
you start to believe that you are worth that life worth living, and it makes it a lot easier to actually continue to make those motions. Like I call it like fake it till you make it almost, you know, put those motions in, create that life worth living, and eventually it feels like life is worth living. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And so with our listeners, hopefully it'll bless somebody who, who catches it either live or in our archives. Now, have you ever thought about putting your poems into song? Have you ever thought about t- taking them in and making a song out of them? Oh, my goodness, I've never thought of that. You're you're inspiring me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, if you, I, just something if you ever thought, whether you sang it, or you put in a lyric and you, of course, copyright it, and someone else sings uh, one of his songs. Uh, this uh, the the messaging in their poems. It, people don't like that type of empowerment, especially if it's you get the right singer to sing it. You never know what could come of it. Now, I definitely have to ask you this: with five minutes to go, is writing a novel in your future, and why or why not? Oh, it is. I'm actually working on a um, endometriosis and pelvic pain memoir right now. Um, it's very slow going. I am just obsessed with poetry, so I always get sidetracked by. Well, I have working on I think four poetry projects right now, um, but there's always something going on behind the scenes. But I think as I get older, I'm going to want to write more and more essays, long form, and maybe novels. You never know. Okay. Now, what advice, Maggie, would you give to someone who is looking to write and publish a poetry collection for the very first time? Believe in yourself and find community. Instagram is one place, podcasts like this, um, listening to other poets on podcasts like this um, and, and just absorbing that information and making those connections because it's really a supportive environment. And it can feel daunting, but there's tons of free tips out there. And there's people like me. I'm a self-publishing coach. And uh, so I'll just help you believe in yourself. And whether you just follow me for some inspiring free reels or you actually have a session with me one-on-one, like I just want you to believe in yourself because your story is worth sharing and it will touch at least one person out there. And so I think that that's my main goal is to like really empower people to tell their stories. Um, because, again, one person, that's all that matters. If you touch one person, it's worth it. Now, I didn't know you offered this. So c- tell us a little bit more about the service you offer and how somebody could get in touch with you to work with you. Yeah, um, you can get in touch with me on my website or on my Instagram at maggie.writes, um, or, or W-R-I-T-E-S. Um, I offer self-publishing consultations so I can walk you through from the very beginning all the way to the end or whatever parts in between that you're struggling with, whether it's creating the metadata and the stuff you send to libraries and bookstores or whether it's formatting the book itself or whether it's marketing and getting into bookstores and doing readings. I, I help people kind of navigate that process with my past experience and going through those things. Okay, and how long is that? Is that is that like a month? Is that as long as they yeah. need? As much or as little as you need. Some people have one or two calls with me, and we get everything taken care of. I, I try and support people outside of our calls, too. You know, um, I'm not just here when you're on the hour-long call with me. I'm also doing some work before and after and reposting your stuff because I really get excited for my clients because they're passionate, you know. And I also have a client that's been working with me for three months because she needed a little more attention on her book and a little more help with each stage. So it's kind of whatever really you're looking for. Right? Some people just need a little, you know, kick and, and just like, yeah, I believe in you. And then they, they really feel like they can take it from there, you know. Okay. Where can off-the-shelf listeners get a copy of your books, Maggie? I am available everywhere. You can get me at Barnes & Nobles, at Amazon. You can get me on my website. You can DM me for a signed copy, any of those things. So anywhere you buy your books. And you can, can you tell us for your independent? Mm-hmm. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, for independent, independent bookstores. Book yes, so you okay. can order it at any independent bookstore in America or in other countries. Wow! Can you tell us then? If you mentioned social media, where can people uh, connect with you on social media as well? 
Yeah, on Instagram and TikTok, I am at Maggie, M-A-T-T-I-E, dot rights, R-I-T-E-S, and that is on both. Okay. Oh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure. We have had Maggie it's- Boyer here with us. She's from Greensboro, North Carolina, and some of her works, the whole story, when I bleed poems about endometriosis, she's working on a memoir, Ungodly and Allergies, and we didn't even get to allergies. You can check her out online at MaggieBoyer.com, M-A-G-G-I-E-B-O-W-Y-E-R.com. Again, M-A-G-G-I-E-B-O-W-Y-E-R.com. Oh, my goodness. If you guys came in middle or late in the show, it's Saturday. Some people like, I ain't getting up early. Um, When the show finishes streaming, you can listen to it in the archives, and it's Friday. Share, share with people who might be dealing with a chronic illness or, or they're going through something where they're having a hard time accepting themselves and they're really struggling, struggling to get through the day. I really encourage you to share this. I really, really, really encourage you to share this uh, this show with, with them. I don't get any money from it, so that's not why I'm asking, but it might be helpful to somebody as they um, – they listen to the show. Thank you, Maggie. Oh, my goodness. Thank what a blessing. Denise. Thank you, Maggie. Maggie Boyer. Check her out again, MaggieBoyer.com. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for taking time out of your day to be here with us and our listeners here on Off the Shelf. And to our listeners, as I always tell you, you are awesome. You're incredible. You are amazing. Go out and create a fabulous day for yourself, Maggie. I will send you a link to the show when it finishes streaming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.